Almost daily, Chinese military aircraft violate Taiwan's airspace. With each passing day, the likelihood increases that instead of reconnaissance, these planes will strike airfields and air defense systems. This could be the starting signal for a major war in the Pacific, or even World War III. In his speeches, Xi Jinping emphasizes that mainland China and Taiwan will inevitably reunite. And if it doesn't happen peacefully, he's ready to resort to a forceful scenario, and no one will stop him. Why is China willing to risk the lives of thousands of its soldiers, economic prosperity, regime stability, and its position in the world for just one island? There's a popular belief that Beijing wants to establish control over all territories and lands that once belonged to the Chinese Empire. However, it's somewhat more complex. A brief historical context is necessary. The roots of the problem go back to the early 20th century when the Xinhai Revolution took place in China under internal and external pressures. It ended not only the nearly 300-year rule of the Qing Dynasty, but also the monarchy in general. The Republic of China emerged in place of the empire. Around the same time, the nationalist Kuomintang Party was founded, which began to take over full power in the chaos-engulfed country. The Chinese Communist Party appeared in the early 1920s and initially didn't represent a serious political force. Moreover, it allied with the Kuomintang against numerous warlords and formations that were tearing the country apart at the time. However, as its influence and popularity grew, ideological differences between the Communists and the Kuomintang came to the fore. The confrontation eventually erupted into a civil war, which ended in 1949 with the victory of the Communists. After that, Kuomintang leader Chiang Kai-shek, the government, a large part of officials, and the remnants of the army were forced to flee to the island of Taiwan. Subsequently, the island became the last part of the Republic of China that was not captured by the Communists. Mao Zedong and his comrades proclaimed the People's Republic of China on the mainland, while Taiwan logically inherited the name Republic of China. At first, Chiang Kai-shek viewed the evacuation as a temporary measure and planned to regain power on the mainland after the population became disillusioned with the communists. Beijing, on the other hand, viewed Taiwan as a rebellious province that would sooner or later return under its control. So, as in the case of Korea, we have an example of a nation divided for political reasons. The U.S. supported the Kuomintang and considered the government in Taipei as the only legitimate authority. Washington also viewed the Republic of China as an important ally in the Asia-Pacific region and provided it with various support. China was represented by Taiwan's diplomats in the UN. However, in 1950, Secretary of State Dean Acheson stated that the U.S. defense perimeter in the Pacific Ocean ran along the Aleutian Islands to the Ryukyu Islands in Japan. That is, it did not include Taiwan and South Korea, which the communist camp perceived as an invitation to aggression. The Korean War broke out that same year. After this, Washington's attitude towards Taiwan changed. In 1954, a mutual defense treaty was signed between the U.S. and the Republic of China. It contained provisions with guarantees of military assistance to the other side if it was attacked. American nuclear weapons were even deployed on the island. In the early 1970s, a new geopolitical reality emerged. Relations between the PRC and the USSR reached their lowest point, even leading to border armed clashes. At the same time, the US government decided that its enemy was not communism itself, but specifically the USSR. So, Washington saw an opportunity to gain a valuable ally against Moscow. A process of detente was launched. The legitimacy of the communist government in Beijing was officially recognized, and its diplomats began to represent China in the UN. American investments started flowing into China, and enterprises began to open. Taiwan's status changed from the legal successor of the Republic of China to an unrecognized state without any guarantees of protection. Now it is recognized by only about a dozen countries, mainly from South America and Oceania. Nixon, by his decree, removed nuclear weapons from the island. The only consolation for the islanders was the signing of the Taiwan Relations Act in 1979, which regulated various aspects, including security. The treaty still has legal force and allows Washington to pursue a policy of strategic ambiguity towards the island. 
On the one hand, it does not guarantee that it will defend the island in case of invasion. On the other hand, it also does not declare non-intervention if aggression does occur. This approach has managed to deter Beijing's ambitions in the past, but it's not certain that it will continue to do so. After official recognition of the communist government in Beijing and effectively falling into diplomatic isolation, serious changes began in Taiwan. Taipei's elites realized that the dream of returning to the mainland was unattainable and began to develop the island as a separate republic. After several decades of one-party dictatorship by the Kuomintang, the country transitioned to democratization and multi-party system. Large-scale economic reforms and industrial modernization began, which quickly bore fruit. Taiwan became one of the Asian tigers. There was even a warming of relations between the two Chinas. The island republic began to invest in the mainland and launch its productions there. However, the thaw ended with Xi Jinping's rise to power. During his rule, he managed to resolve all intra-party disagreements. In fact, this allowed him to be elected for a third term in 2022, contrary to the established tradition of rotating the top leadership after two terms. Considering this background, the idea of a final break with mainland China and declaration of independence is gaining more popularity among Taiwanese. A survey conducted in 2021 showed that 77% of citizens of the island republic consider the PRC an unfriendly state. Almost 7% want to declare independence as soon as possible, and only 1 in 10 respondents supports reunification with mainland China. This is already affecting the political and electoral process. The center-left Democratic Progressive Party, which advocates for declaring independence, strengthening the island's defense potential, and establishing friendly relations with other democratic states, has been consistently winning the latest parliamentary and presidential elections. The previous leader, Tsai Ing-wen, who held the position for two terms and the newly elected Lai ching belonged to this party. Meanwhile, the Kuomintang, which supports gradual rapprochement with the PRC, has effectively lost its status as the main political force on the island. In 2020, they suffered a crushing defeat in the elections, winning only 38 out of 113 seats. The PRC has political and ideological reasons for occupying Taiwan. Modern PRC propaganda convinces that it was the CCP that ended the era of humiliation of the Celestial Empire and returned greatness and prosperity to its people. Meanwhile, Taiwan's example shows that communism was not the only alternative path for the Chinese, that they can achieve significant economic success with a democratic system. Such an alternative acts as a serious irritant for Xi and the top leadership, as it has a negative impact on the legitimacy of their regime. Regarding the economy, Taiwan's GDP last year was $751 billion, placing it 22nd in the ranking of the wealthiest countries in the world. The Republic's wealth comes from the high-tech sector. Well-known brands such as Acer, HTC, Transcend, and Asus originate from here. However, the main asset of the unrecognized island republic is TSMC, the world's largest specialized semiconductor manufacturer. It accounts for almost 30% of the global chip market, with clients including Apple, Microsoft, AMD, NVIDIA, and others. There's a high probability that the semiconductors in the device you're watching this video on were made in Taiwan. In addition to this, the island is located at the intersection of important trade routes between East Asia, Europe, and the USA. Establishing control over Taiwan will significantly strengthen the PRC's economy and make it a hegemon in the high-tech industry. Finally, China has ambitions to become a powerful maritime state, and it is the hostile and well-armed Taiwan that prevents the Red Dragon from flexing its muscles in the Philippine, South China, and East China Seas. Also, under Taipei's control, are the Pratas, Pescadores, and Paracel Islands, near which large deposits of natural resources were found. Approximately 11 billion barrels of oil and almost 200 trillion cubic meters of natural gas. Some intelligence services point to Beijing's plans to start an operation to capture Taiwan by 2027. China's hurry is related to the fact that Taiwan could indeed declare independence. In such a case, an invasion of the island would no longer look like resolving an internal Chinese problem, but aggression against another state. And this would mean completely different scenarios for Beijing. 
Plus, it would allow Taipei to conclude cooperation agreements with other states, including security ones. Also, we can't ignore the personal factor. Xi Jinping has effectively secured sole power for life. As history shows, after this, most dictators feel confined within their states and resort to foreign policy adventures. Thus, Saddam attacked Kuwait, Gaddafi attacked Chad, Putin attacked Ukraine. Xi Jinping has already turned 70. It's just at this time that many authoritarian rulers start thinking about their place in history textbooks and capturing the rebellious island, which neither the great helmsman Mao nor his predecessors managed to do, is the easiest way to secure a place in the pantheon of the greatest leaders of modern China. The Declaration of Taiwan's Independence also has support in the U.S. A Chicago Council on Global Affairs survey showed that almost 70% of Americans support recognizing the island as a separate republic, and over half advocate providing it with military assistance in case of Chinese aggression. Recently, Xi Jinping has spared no expenses or resources for his army. In 2023, China's defense spending amounted to almost $220 billion, the highest among all Asian states. For comparison, India, which aspires to be a regional leader, spends almost $74 billion, and Japan, next after it, spends almost $50 billion. Xi Jinping pays special attention to the development of his navy, Aircraft carriers are considered the main argument in maritime disputes, and currently, the Chinese Navy has three ships of this type. The first was the Liaoning, a converted Soviet aircraft carrier cruiser Varyag. Based on it, they created the Shandong, which has an improved radar and can carry more aircraft and ammunition. Also, in 2015, the construction of the large aircraft carrier Fujian began whose design was inspired by the famous American Kitty Hawk-class aircraft carriers. It was launched in 2022 and is currently in the testing phase. All three ships do not have a nuclear installation, which makes them significantly inferior to their American counterparts. However, there is evidence that the CCP intends to correct this deficiency and has ordered two aircraft carriers with nuclear power. In total, by 2035, China plans to have six aircraft carriers at its disposal. For a long time, Chinese admirals focused on speed and maneuverability, so shipyards were mainly ordered to build frigates, corvettes, and missile cruisers. Currently, their numbers are estimated at 42, 72, and 107 respectively. There are currently 50 heavier destroyers, but this number is planned to be doubled by the end of this decade. Beijing's plans to actually arrange its D-Day on Taiwan are indicated by the number of various types of landing ships. These include six Zuber-class ships, 15 amphibious hovercraft, eight Type 071 dock ships, three Type 075 universal landing craft, and approximately 80 small and large landing boats. The Chinese Navy calls anti-ship missiles its main trump card. In 2022, a new YJ-21 ballistic missile was introduced which is allegedly capable of hitting targets at a distance of 1,500 kilometers. Since it has hardly been used yet, Western experts doubt its claimed characteristics, as there is a problem with targeting accuracy. This could be a bluff by Chinese admirals, designed to make their American counterparts unwilling to expose aircraft carriers to Chinese missile strikes and keep them away from Taiwan. The PRC Army numbers 2 million people, making it the largest in the world. However, in the case of a landing on Taiwan, the Marine Corps will play a critically important role. Until recently, this branch of the military was used to guard the coast and was small in number. Now Beijing is going to increase the size of its Marine Corps to 40,000, and according to some data, to 100,000. The U.S. has the largest defense budget in the world. Last year alone, it was $905 billion. It is also the only country that has 11 nuclear-powered aircraft carriers with escort groups. With all this, the U.S. Navy is generally going through tough times. In terms of the number of ships and their tonnage, they are already inferior to the Chinese. Even more threatening is that its firepower is also weakening. For example, the Ticonderoga class of missile cruisers is planned to be decommissioned from the fleet in the coming years due to its respectable age. The development of its successor, the DDG-X class, is proceeding with great difficulties. 
the appearance of its first specimens on duty is not expected before the middle of the next decade. The Navy also suffers from a shortage of personnel. However, Washington plans to significantly increase spending on the fleet, increase its numbers, and technological advancement. The U.S. Marine Corps is expecting a radical military reform. They will lose their M1 Abrams tanks and most of their tube artillery, and instead will be armed with drones and missile systems. Recently, the Marines received a new base on the island of Guam and also began to work out hypothetical scenarios of confrontation with the Chinese on Taiwan. Taiwan has at its disposal a professional army of approximately 170,000 men and a navy with almost 170 ships. The Air Force of the Island Republic has 600 aircraft at its disposal, including 150 time-tested F-16s. In the event of a PRC invasion, it can definitely count on two allies, Russia and North Korea. The former has already found itself under sanctions, has broken relations with the West, and is now very dependent on Beijing in terms of providing essential goods and the functioning of the economy in general. However, it is unlikely that Putin will be able to provide any significant help, as his army is bogged down in Ukraine. North Korea has been a de facto vassal of China for many years, which allows its economy to function under a strict sanctions regime. Some geopolitical observers tend to believe that Kim Jong-un, by prior agreement with Comrade Xi, may start provocations on the border with South Korea simultaneously with the start of the invasion to distract the U.S. Former Soviet Central Asian republics and states participating in the One Belt, One Road project may also support Beijing. However, their support is unlikely to go beyond purely moral support and voting in the UN. As for the US and Taiwan, their policy in the Pacific region is supported by Japan, Australia, and the Philippines. The latter, according to polls, demonstrates the greatest determination to support the island republic militarily. Along with Vietnam, they are the only ASEAN states that demonstrate zero support for the PRC if it starts a conflict. The only problem is that these countries currently have rather weak navies and are only planning to modernize them, and this reduces the likelihood of their direct participation in the defense of Taiwan. Given the multiple advantage of the PRC in the number of troops and equipment, it seems that only the absence of Xi Jinping's decree separates Taiwan from occupation. But in reality, everything is much more complicated. Amphibious landing operations are the most complex type of military operations. They require perfect cooperation between ground forces, aviation and navy, as well as perfect logistics. China not only has no experience in such operations, but also has minimal real combat experience in general. The last time the Chinese army fought seriously was in 1979 when it began an invasion of Vietnam. Moreover, it ended quite badly then. Due to the fierce resistance of Hanoi's army, the Chinese had to retreat, and the leadership in Beijing announced that all set tasks were completed. Taiwan, on the other hand, has been preparing for this battle throughout its history. For a long time, the basis of its defense doctrine was the porcupine strategy. It consisted of maximizing the losses of the enemy and generally the price that the PRC troops would have to pay for invading here. A hypothetical invasion would consist of several stages, establishing a blockade, destroying air defense systems, missile defense, radars, hangars, and warehouses with missile strikes direct landing, and taking control of all strategically important objects. At each of these stages, many things can go wrong. Taiwanese warships are few in number and quite outdated, but they can still cause significant damage, being covered by good air defense. Taiwan also has a large number of anti-ship missiles on truck chassis, and it will not be possible to destroy them all with a preventive strike. That is, the PRC Navy can establish a blockade but will pay a high price for it. It is also unclear how Chinese admirals will behave if the U.S., contrary to the blockade, sends its ships to Taiwanese ports. In addition, Taipei can adopt the tactics of using small sea drones. It has already helped Ukraine to effectively lift the sea blockade, even in the absence of a fleet. Taiwan is small in size, about the size of Maryland. It doesn't have many places to organize shelters and warehouses, but it's easier to cover with air defense and missile defense systems. Even the U.S. has no experience in breaking through such dense air defense. 
The basis of the air defense system is the AN-FPS-115 Pave Pause Radar, which is capable of scanning the entire territory of the PRC. It is located on a mountain 2600 meters high and has its own air defense system, so it will be difficult to destroy. If the PRC troops fail to destroy or seriously damage the island's air defense, the landing may not take place at all. History already knows a similar precedent, the Battle of Britain during World War II. However, even if it manages to move to this phase, this is where the biggest nightmare for the invasion army can begin. Taiwan is a rocky island with a very difficult landscape. Only 14 beaches are suitable for landing, and all of them are well fortified. All men after 19 underwent four-month military service. Recently, this term was increased to a year. That is, in case of mobilization, the army can easily increase threefold, or even more. The coast of Taiwan is almost one continuous urban development, behind which industrial zones begin. Its assault will cost the advancing troops extremely dearly. Taiwanese are considered masters of urban camouflage. They know how to disguise tanks and other equipment as piles of garbage or utility vehicles. Taiwan has clearly learned the lessons of Ukraine and is actively purchasing stingers, javelins, and castrels, locally produced grenade launchers, for its army. The U.S. is also going to provide the Island Republic with HIMARS MLRS, Abrams tanks, and F-16s, as well as generally invest in the modernization of its armed forces, all to make the porcupine's needles as sharp as possible. Finally, Taiwanese officials announced that they have hypersonic missiles capable of reaching Beijing at their disposal. That is, the war is unlikely to be fought only on the island and the waters around it. If Beijing does dare to prepare an invasion, it will not go unnoticed. Of course, it will be disguised as exercises, but this trick did not work in the case of Russia. China may try to resort to a rapid operation exclusively with its special forces, which can be prepared secretly. In March, it was discovered that a copy of the presidential palace in Taiwan was built on one of the Chinese training grounds. It is quite likely that Comrade Xi's general's plan is to quickly capture or destroy the political leadership of the Republic. However, doing this with small forces already smells like an adventure that could turn into a real catastrophe. Currently, there are three possible scenarios for Taiwan's future fate. The first is maintaining the current status quo. The second is peaceful integration based on the one country, two systems policy. However, after the de facto annexation of Hong Kong, Taiwanese do not believe Beijing's promises to preserve autonomy. The third is a full-scale invasion. However, even if the US and Japan do not intervene directly, it is not certain that China will be able to destroy the military infrastructure and break the islanders' will to resist with the first strike. In this case, the Chinese are waiting for a long, exhausting, and bloody battle. During it, Taiwan's economy will be destroyed which will largely negate all the benefits of occupying the island. This will be a classic example of a Pyrrhic victory. However, if the U.S. does decide to intervene, its fleet stationed near the base on Guam Island can come to Taiwan's aid in just five hours. Most likely, Tokyo, which has been actively militarizing in recent years, will not stay away either. Numerous war games show that the Allies will be able to defeat the PRC and prevent the occupation of the island. The price will be high, the Americans may lose one of their aircraft carrier groups. However, it is worth considering that such simulations are based on the assumption that the opponent will not make mistakes at all, and its equipment will work perfectly. Thank you for watching and peace to you.